thank you, everyone. You know, um, uh, I'm not uh, I'm I'm not a practitioner uh, of the arts, except for one uh, example of this past year, which I'll, sh I'll I'll talk to you a little bit about. Um, but I um, have always been fascinated by you know it, it, it's great. I was sitting next to Charles Swanson, who is the uh, director of the Hanshaw Auditorium, and I was just telling him that we lived about 30 minutes from the University of Iowa in Muscatine, Iowa. My, both my father and my mother were huge um, arts patrons. They um, were both singers, and uh, my mother played the piano when she was growing up in Korea. Uh, they went to school in New York City and uh, literally scrapped together all their money to go to the opera and to the symphony. And so Hanshire Auditorium in Iowa quite literally kept my parents alive. Without Hanshire Auditorium. <laughs> I remember as a kid being dragged, uh, and that's how it felt, uh, uh, to concerts, but I saw Emile Gilles play the piano, I saw uh, Horowitz, I saw the greatest uh, musicians, and I didn't even know what was happening to me. Um, uh, you know, I was, a, I was an athlete and I wanted to, to play sports and things, and yet that exposure has stuck with me forever. My sister is an opera singer now because of her um, uh, many, many summers in the University of Iowa music camps, and uh, she, she's she's teaching and she's not singing as much professionally anymore. So it's been important to me, and, and important to me in a way that I didn't always realize. This is the group Palabolus. They made this um, uh, to welcome me. Uh, I was so touched by that that they would do that. And if you look at it carefully, there's incredible complexity that that's all human beings. And of course, you know, and you'll see tonight, um, Palabas was started here, and we're so, so proud of them. Uh, and that's the sort of creativity that we truly want to engender in our students. You know, at my inauguration, I brought a group, and they're called Samul Nori. And literally, in Korean, it means four things play. Samul Nori. And the reason I asked them is because uh, for the last 25 years, I've been doing mostly social justice work. And so music, for me, uh, was most interesting in its most revolutionary form. This is farmer's music. And in the 60s and 70s, if you participated in Samar Nori, which is really the, the banging of, uh, of uh, literally pots and pans, that's what they were made out of, and drums, and singing and doing the farmer's very athletic dances, you could get arrested. So doing Samar Nori was a sign of resistance to the military government. Now it's become part of uh, uh, what's now thought of as Korean folklore, but think about what's happening in the arts in Korea. You know, when I went there to visit recently, um, there were two huge concerns. One was, oh my goodness, we're teaching all of our classes in English, we're gonna lose our culture. But then the people who really understood a lot more said, but wait a minute, 99% of the movies that Korean people watch are in Korean. And 90 plus percent of the music Koreans listen to is in Korean. In fact, something called Hwalyu, which is the wave of Korean culture, is spreading across Asia. They have redone uh, 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 the uh, uh, hip hop music in Korean form. And it's now all over Asia uh, in Korean being appreciated in so many different ways. So, on the one hand, they're being very practical and saying the language, the lingua franca of the world is English, so we're gonna teach in English. But culture, in the form of music, in the form of movies, is actually moving very strongly in the direction of an indigenous uh, cultural production system that has kept alive um, uh, cultural themes and the language in a way that's just extraordinary. Um, I, myself, am hooked on Korean soap operas, but the Korean soap operas, <laughs> The, the ones that, we, that my wife and I watched from beginning to end were of uh, uh, the gentleman that originated Korean traditional medicine, that wrote the greatest text on Korean traditional medicine. So not only was it interesting for us, but it was difficult to understand because they were using language from 150 years ago. So uh, the arts have done this extraordinary thing for Korea. Not only are they uh, barreling forward with internationalism, in fact, the, the level of ling English literacy because of the decisions they've made is just far and away higher than in Japan. And I think it's given them a very strategic advantage. And at the same time, they're eclipsing Japan in terms of the amount of cultural production and, the way, uh, and, and their ability to export it. 
So I have been a student of it, uh, uh, of the arts, not a practitioner, but a student of it, but for pretty specific reasons. This is an extraordinary place here. You know, um, President Hopkins uh, from 1916 to 1945, he was president during the Depression, during World War I, and he always wanted to build an arts center, but just didn't have the resources to do it. So his successor, John Sloan Dickey, from the class of 1929, who was a student under President Hopkins, built it in his honor. The architect on the far left is Wallace Harrison. Someone, some of you may know him. He's the person who designed the Metropolitan Opera, uh, Lincoln Center, Rockefeller Center, and the UN building. So the, um, uh, the, the lineage of this building is really quite extraordinary. You know, uh, the arts, and you all know this better than anyone, the arts without any explanation without any justification, without any rationalization, are important. Um, I, you know, as an anthropologist, study the drawings in the caves of Lascaux in France and uh, understand that it's not that there was any kind of utility to art. It just has been a part of human civilization for as long as we know. But let me be a little bit nerdy and um, raise a couple of questions. And the questions that have come to my mind again and again. Why is art so important? Why is art so unifying from place to place? You know, um, in the poorest communities on the face of the earth, uh, the devotion to the arts is sometimes so um, uh, ferocious that it knocked me back. Uh, first time I visited Haiti, we went to a village uh, that was a three-hour walk. And it was, I was taken there specifically because it was the poorest village of all. And as we walked into the village, a group of children uh, expecting us came over the hill and serenaded us. And it was one of the most moving moments. And I thought, oh my goodness, these people are dying of tuberculosis and starvation. This children came over and serenaded us and sang three or four wonderful songs. And then they killed their practically only chicken to feed us. And so the fact that no matter where you go, uh, people, no matter how poor they are, are ferociously dedicated to their art is something that um, requires, I think, uh, at least understanding, if not explanation. In Rwanda, uh, right down the street from our um, uh, clinic, is an artisan's workshop where they make um, beautiful relief paintings out of cow dung, because that's the only thing they have. That's the only thing that will form and harden, and, and I have uh, many of those uh, in my own home. So. Uh, uh, Forgive me for um, thinking of arts first as, as a way of capturing a revolutionary spirit, and second, uh, as a way of expression that uh, is uh, so ubiquitous across cultures that, that it leads me to ask a question. What are the biological, moral, um, uh, deeply physiological aspects of the arts that makes it so persistent and that make people devoted to it so ferociously. You know, with Brian Kennedy and a group of others, um, uh, we began exploring a question. Uh, and the question for us was uh, not what are the subjects we need to teach here at Dartmouth College. I mean, I was a new president. I was allowed to ask um, uh, really, really uh, simplistic questions. But we asked a different set of questions. What are the fundamental habits of the mind that we are trying to build in our students? What are we doing to 18 to 22 year old brains? One of the things I came in here knowing was that our sense of neuroplasticity, uh, the ability for the brain to evolve and change uh, throughout one's lifetime is far greater than any of us had thought. We thought it was pretty much done by 18 or 19. In fact, neural connections are being made and remade all the time. One of my uh, closest friends um, is the uh, world's expert on computational neuroanatomy mapping out the connections and how they change over a lifetime. And what we know there's great, is there's great plasticity. And so it's not just that we're teaching people subjects. We're trying to instill them in them fundamental habits of the mind that will serve them forever. And the interesting thing for us was we learned that neuroscientists, educational specialists, psychologists, were all uh, getting more and more subtle and effective in distinguishing the habits of the mind that you can both study and impart to students. So we began looking at this. Now let me just read you something from an extremely nerdy paper that tried to look at the role of arts 
and um, uh, neurophysiology. And in this paper, in an Italian journal of neuroscience, uh, the authors write, nonetheless, an overall view of the findings suggests that the aesthetic, that the aesthetic experience of visual artworks is characterized by the activation of, colon, sensor motor areas, core emotional centers, and reward-related centers. In the present review, we discuss the functional relevance of these activations and propose that aesthetic experience is a multi-level process exceeding a purely visual analysis of artworks and relying upon visceral motor and somatomotor resonance in the beholder. Arts is so wonderful, it's so complex, and it's so deeply human that it's forcing science to rethink its own language. We're now trying to understand how it is that the arts uh, does so many things at once. In other words, there are many, many parts of the brain that have been so well uh, uh, defined now, and art seems to go in and barrage many different parts of it at the same time. One of the habits of the mind um, that we talk about uh, is creating imaging innovation. And so if you, th this was part of the performance that uh, was, was, uh, was done at the inauguration, and it was just stunning. It was uh, incredibly sensual. It was beautifully artistic. It was unbelievably um, uh, athletic. And all I remember from it, I don't remember any of the particular moves, but I remember the emotion of being in that audience when they were doing this. And I then went and talked to the young people who, who were part of the dance. And I said, how did you come up with this? They said, well, we did it. I said, were you all dancers? And no, you know, one was a cross player, another one was a football player, another one was a diver, a swimmer. They had all come to this, and they were telling me that um, this was causing uh, uh, their own view of themselves and the world to change dramatically after having been involved in sports. So there's something very different about uh, dance, and I'll talk more about that in a bit. Persisting. Uh, persisting is probably the most important of the habits of the mind that we need to teach. This is based on tons of evidence now that um, uh, is evident in books that are t uh, entitled uh, Talent is Overrated. The notion that in order to achieve mastery, you, you need 10,000 hours of practice. And of course, Malcolm Gladwell's uh, very popular book, Outliers, you know, shows that, um, uh, or argues that um, uh, you know, Bill Gates and, and Bill Joy of Sun Microsystems uh, were successful because they had 10,000 hours at a computer before they started their company. The Beatles had 10,000 hours of practice in Hamburg before uh, they really made it big in the United States and elsewhere. And I now believe that. I've looked at the evidence carefully, and it has changed fundamentally the way I think about my, um, about my two sons. Uh, I used to say, well, try something, and after about 15 minutes, if they didn't have talent in it, I would let them stop. Or I would tell them to stop. But that's not the right way. <laughs> So uh, the persistence, I would argue, uh, and the neuroscientists seem to argue, is learned more effectively in the arts than almost anything else. That the persistence that one learns from playing the piano, for example, seems to have an impact on children's ability to handle conflict. Wow. <clears throat> Questioning and posing problems. I just want to show you this picture. This is one of our um, um, design classes. And right there in the front in the red, um, uh, in the red uh, um, uh, vest is Peter Williamson, uh, class of 2012, the number one golfer in the Ivy League a year ago um, uh, from Hanover. And he's in that class because he wants to be a professional golfer and then design golf courses. But the way he talks to me after this class about designing golf courses is unlike anything I've ever heard. Uh, it's, um, it, it's, it's at a level of depth and a level of uh, uh, understanding of both the natural environment and what natural spaces do to people's minds that's really stunning. So questioning and posing problems is another habit of the mind. And uh, for Peter Williamson, who all his life wanted to be a professional golfer, Dartmouth's class in design has changed in a dramatic way. And this is from conversations last year and this year after he took that class. At the Harvard Graduate School of Education, they've been conducting studies, part on art, in the classroom. And um, uh, they have took, taken the habits of the mind and, and, and spun them a little bit differently. These are sp the specific habits of the mind that they think the arts create in, uh, in young people. Uh, developing craft, engaging and persisting, envisioning, expressing, observing. These are 
Really, really important. Moreover, James Catterall's analysis of the Department of Education's data demonstrate that, and I, and I quote here, students with high levels of arts participation outperform arts poor students by virtually every measure. In accounting for socioeconomic status, a closer look showed that high arts participation makes a more significant difference to students from low income backgrounds than for high income students. They also found clear evidence that sustained involvement in particular art forms, music and theater, are highly correlated with success in mathematics and reading. You know, um, uh, there's a very, very interesting set of works that I've just become familiar with. There's a book that many of you may know called This Is Your Brain on Music. And this is another book by a uh, neuroscientist who was trying to understand the role of music in, in neural development. He looked at, at timbre, p rhythm, pitch, and harmony and tied them to neuroanatomy, neurochemistry, cognitive psychology, and evolution. And most importantly, he challenged Steven Pinker, a former colleague of mine at Harvard, Steven Pinker's notion that music is uh, a sort of auditory cheesecake, that was his term, and, and that it was an incidental byproduct of evolution. Uh, but uh, the author of This Is Your Brain on Music argued that music served as an indicator of cognitive, emotional, and physical health and was evolutionarily advantageous as a force that led to social bonding and increased fitness. And he cited the arguments of people like Charles Darwin, Jeffrey Miller, and others. Dance. One of our own students um, uh, who received her PhD here at Dartmouth in, uh, in 2008, Emily Cross, was in the dance ensemble and she used fellow dancers for functional MRI studies on learning and memory. And she found that learning to dance by effective observation is closely related to um, uh, learning by physical practice, both in the level of achievement and also the neural substrates that support the organization of complex actions. Effective observational learning may transfer to other skills. In other words, uh, uh, when they do studies where they try to teach people how to dance, the exercise of watching a dance and then trying to do it actually improves one's ability to learn by observation. So again, we don't need any of these justifications, but boy, isn't this interesting? <laughs> there, was a, there was a series of papers um, that were um, uh, 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 a result of a meeting that was led by one of our former faculty members, Mike Kazaniga. And um, they looked at the differences in the functional MRI neurophysiology of artists and non-artists. And uh, here is what the results, the overall results of that meeting came to. An interest in a performing art leads to a high state of motivation. So it changes your motivation that produces the sustained attention necessary to improve performance and the training of attention that leads to improvement in other domains of cognition. For six-year-olds, sustained uh, practice in the arts led to, as I said, in six-year-olds, better conflict resolution. There are specific links between high levels of music training and the ability to manipulate information in both working and long-term memory. In children, uh, there are specific links between the practice of music and skills in geometrical representation. Correlations exist between music training in both reading acquisition and sequence learning. Training in acting appears to lead to memory improvement through the learning of general skills for manipulating semantic information. You know, um, we have a requirement here at Dartmouth, um, but it's a requirement that you can fulfill by, by taking a studio art course or by just taking, or by taking an art history course. These are all, um, this is important. But the question for me now is that given all this information, do we have to change our requirements? Do we have to change our requirements so that people actually engage in performance, in learning how to dance, and something like that because of the benefits for neural formation? 18 to 22 is a time when they're still very, very active uh, uh, neural, uh, uh, we're making very you know, important neural connections, but this evidence and uh, the, the, uh, uh, my recent exposure to it has led me to rethink, well, what? So, so how, how would we reshape our curriculum in a way that would take advantage of the extraordinary benefit directly to students 
of exposure to participation in the arts. You know, this is one of <clears throat> a scene from a recent production here, Vis uh, the Viscera, the Echoes of War. And we have uh, just given a, uh, a, a, um, uh, an honorary degree to James Noctway from the class of 1970, whose photography has uh, actually led to changes in policy that, that uh, I am directly aware of. These are multi-drug resistant tuberculosis patients, patients who, <clears throat> whom I've uh, uh, taken care of myself. This is in a particular place in South Africa, Tugela Ferry, where they had one of the worst outbreaks of this disease uh, in, in, uh, in recorded history. So, um, uh, I'm, I, I, in addition to the neurological benefit, the importance of uh, the arts for the revolutionary purpose is even stronger. So, uh, uh, when Haiti happened, uh, when, the, when, the, when, the, uh, when the earthquake happened, uh, it was an incredibly difficult time for me because I just left uh, Boston and my daily work with, the, um, with, uh, with Partners in Health. And um, I really thought that I was gonna have to sit this one out. I was gonna have to just watch the response and not do anything. But among the things that the students did, first of all, the students raised more than $250,000, which was about five times more than any other college or university in the country. Our alums stepped up and um, donated close to $5 million for the relief effort. Our, our students did such a great job that other students from all over the uh, country were calling to see how they organized themselves. But they also uh, had a concert and felt that this was one of the ways that uh, Dartmouth College was going to uh, uh, make its own moral position uh, felt. As you know, we're building a new art center. It's very, very important for us. And uh, even more important in that, I, I think you know, um, others will talk to you more about that, but here's my perspective on it. Uh, as I was, um, uh, soon after I was named uh, president in, in March of last year, uh, we had this question, in the face of this economic crisis, do we go forward with the Visual Arts Center? And at that time, I was just becoming familiar, um, you know, in preparation for the job of president, I had been reading uh, some of this literature. And so we decided to go ahead, despite the economic situation, and also um, uh, despite what we thought would be criticism from parts of the community and, and certainly uh, parts of the staff and faculty, for doing this when we were making cuts in so many other areas. But we're so glad we did this. And uh, the, the, the commitment to the Visual Arts Center, despite these uh, economic problems, is a sign of our own uh, uh, commitment to the arts. But let me just end by saying, look, we do the arts because they're just joyous and fun. This was my one performance this year on this, ball, on this stage. Um, I uh, did a cameo in, uh, in, in a Michael Jackson uh, in a Michael Jackson um, medley. And I have to tell you, I have gotten more positive feedback from this than anything I've done all year. <laughs> so the arts are joyous, they're important, they're part of human physiology, they uh, take us back to the origins of human civilization. Moreover, uh, the uh, scientific evidence that participation in the arts is good for your brain is now overwhelming. So it's quite clear to me, uh, the conclusion from all this, is that you know, as a simple-minded physician with no talent in the arts, uh, the only thing I can possibly do is to prescribe more arts for everybody, especially our students. Thank you. Uh -huh.